property concepts and probate cases. It is so important to have a good understanding of property and property concepts when we deal with wills and probate, because after all, wills and probate are, that's just a uh, subdivision, a branch of property law. So what is this thing we call property? Well, property is really an abstract concept. It's, it's uh, what we call a, a bundle of rights, so that when we talk about property, we're, we're not talking about things, we're talking about the rights that we have in those things, those legal rights that make those things our property. And so what are these bundle of rights? Well, it's the right to possess. That means it's that we have the right to exclude others from uh, controlling, possessing the property, that we have the right to uh, control the, um, uh, the repair of it. Uh, we, uh, we have um, uh, another right, the, uh, the use of the property. We get to enjoy it if it's our property. Uh, we get to say who else gets to use or, and enjoy that property. And then finally, we have as the last bundle of, uh, the last right in this bundle of rights, it's the power to dispose. We have the right to dispose of any property that we have. That means leaving it to someone in a will or not leaving it to anyone and having the, uh, the, the law of the state decide who the property passes to, which would naturally normally be our heirs. So those are our bundle of rights that we have when we own property. So what kind of property are, is there? There are several types. We've got real property. And real property is anything that's, that is the land, the land or anything permanently attached to the land. And then we have personal property, and that's everything else. So if it's not real property, it's going to be personal property. And personal property is further divided into two categories, tangible personal property and intangible personal property. Now, tangible personal property is going to be movable. It's, it's, it's tangible. It, there's substance to it. There's a physical existence to it, like, like uh, cars, furniture, jewelry, clothing, uh, any of those things that have a physical substance to it, and they're almost always going to be movable, uh, even livestock or, or, or chattel. And then we have, uh, is the other group, uh, subgroup of property is intangible personal property. And there's no physical presence or existence to intangible personal property. That's going to be things like copyrights or patents or bank accounts or stocks. Yes, you can touch the stock certificate. You can touch the bank uh, statement. You can hold the check book, but that is not where the real value in those types of properties reside. It's the real value is something that cannot be touched. And so that's why we call it intangible personal property. So what all do we own when we have ownership over real property? Now, there's an old English saying that says that the owner of the surface owns the surface of the property and downward to the center of the earth and upward to the stars above. Now that would include then, if you're talking about under the surface of the earth, mineral rights like oil, gas, even coal, and, and other things that you can exploit from the earth. And then above the earth, would, uh, above the surface of the land would be uh, air rights. And so all of these things become very, very important, particularly in Texas, the, the mineral rights and the oil and gas rights that someone may own and may be part of their estate. A 
Another concept we need to have a good understanding of is this notion of concurrent ownership. That means that a piece of property, uh, item of property, could be real, could be personal property, that owned by uh, more than one person concurrently at the same time. And they own it in, in perhaps various shares. Uh, there's several ways in Texas that uh, we may encounter uh, concurrent ownership. Uh, nationwide, typically, there, there, there's a, a fourth one called uh, uh, tenancy by the entirety, which is a marital uh, uh, type of holding that we don't recognize in, in a buy-buy in Texas. We have something else that we'll get to in just a minute. Uh, but in Texas, what we do have are tenants in common, joint tenants with right of survivorship, and community property. Now let's take the first one, tenants in common. That's where people own property together. It's almost like being partners. Uh, they may or may not uh, have the same share of interest in the property. Typically when someone owns property, and that could, once again, real or personal property, when you own it with someone else, not your, your spouse in Texas, you're probably holding it as tenants in common, most likely, but not necessarily. So that's why it's very important when we do probate, we, we understand how a particular property is being held. Joint tenant with right of survivorship. This is a wonderful estate planning tool, and we don't see real property held this way that much in Texas, but we do see a lot of t personal property, particularly intangible personal properties, like stocks and bank accounts particularly, being held as joint tenant with right of survivorship. And what that means is that the owners own the property together, and when one of them passes, the property becomes owned by the surviving. And that's why we say that there is a right of survivorship. Joint tenants with right of survivorship. It's very common with regard to personal property and a wonderful estate planning mechanism. Uh, community property, I alluded to uh, before. This is, in Texas, the way that, that Texan, married Texans hold their marital property. It's as community property. Community property system is actually, actually has two types of property in it. And uh, one is community property where the spouses own the property together in one half shares. And then if it's not community, then it's going to be separate property. And so since separate property is solely owned, we were not, we're not talking about that right now. Uh, community property, each spouse has an equal share in that property. What is community property? It's going to be property, all property that's acquired during the marriage except by gift, devise, or descent. So if someone during a marriage receives a gift, that's their separate property. Now, I guess technically you could make a gift to the husband and wife, but it'd still be one half um, his separate and one half her separate not community, even though they acquired it during the marriage. Uh, so all property acquired during marriage is going to be community property unless, unless it's received by gift, devise, or, or dissent. All right, what is this devise? Someone leaves you something in a will. That is a devise. And once again, that would not be community property. Uh, dissent would be when someone dies without a will and the heirs take that property because they are heirs and the next of kin. Once again, that would not be community property. So community property is that property acquired during marriage except by gift, devise, or descent. And then finally, we need to have a good understanding of this, this notion of probate property versus non-probate property. Probate courts, when we probate a will, or when we are trying to distribute the assets of an estate to uh, the heirs, the probate court is only going to be interested in probate property. That is property that is going to pass either according to the will or 
to the heirs. That would be all property that's solely owned by the testator or testatrix. Uh, that, that would be a person who makes a will uh, or the deceased. The, uh, it would also include any property that the uh, person's estate has in it that was held as a tenant in common with someone else. That would typically be probate property. And then, of course, for husbands and wives in, in Texas, uh, a, a spouse's one-half community property would be probate property, unless it is held in an arrangement uh, of non-probate property that we're going to talk about right now. What would non-probate property be? Well, generally, non-probate property passes without looking at the will, without looking at the intestacy uh, statutes on who takes when there is no will. It passes because it passes to the successor because of some other arrangement, like a joint tenant with right of survivorship that we just talked about. When you hold property with joint tenant with right of survivorship, you become your the survivors become the owner of that property, not the um, whoever set out in the will. Uh, life insurance to a named beneficiary, that doesn't go through the estate. That doesn't have anything to do with the will as long as the insurance policy designates a named beneficiary. Then it's just a contract matter between the insurance company and the person who paid the premiums uh, that you just ignore the, the probate courts. Uh, transfer on death accounts. Sometimes these may be called paid on death accounts or POD accounts. If you've got an account that says, upon my death, I want this account to automatically be transferred to so-and-so, well, that happens regardless of what's in your will. So once again, a POD account or a transfer on death account is going to be uh, a non-probate asset. Living trust, when, when you establish a trust while you're, you're living and set that money aside, the trust will control what happens to that property upon your death. Not the probate court, not the probate, um, uh, not your will. It's uh, that trust instrument says how that property will be disposed of upon your death. Pension plans and IRAs, those are going to be non-probate assets so far as they go to a named beneficiary very much like up at the, uh, the insurance company. It doesn't have anything to do with what happens in probate court. And then, of course, a life estate. A life estate is a particular way that real property is held when, when um, it's held by someone for the duration of their lifetime if they are holding it as a life estate. And then upon their death, it would then pass to uh, the folks that we would call the remainder or the remainder interest. So a very typical situation might be uh, if I'm a farmer, I have children, I have a f and, and I want my children to get my farm, but I'm not ready to move off the farm yet and, and give up living there, but I want them to own the, f the farm and I don't want to leave it to them in the will. Uh, I'd rather make a gift of it now or transfer it to, to them now. So what I would do is transfer or deed my farm to my children, but I would retain a life estate and they would have the remainder interest. And then upon my death, uh, they become the owners of the entire farm. Doesn't go through the probate court, doesn't have anything to do with my will. That's just the arrangement that uh, we set up when I uh, deeded the property to them. And those are some basics on property law as it relates to probate.